myself again. So welcome everybody, welcome to Art Cafe, online art and architecture conversations. My name is Roberta, I'm the founder of Art Tours with a Theme, Art Wit, and as a lockdown pastime, I um, started this free online art cafe. I ask you please to put yourself in mute, mm -hmm. And if you can, please also close your video because that allows to have a bigger bandwidth um, for the quality of what you see. So today we are going to talk about um, skyscrapers architecture in London. And as a reminder, if you missed the past talks, please go to my YouTube channel where you can see the recordings. Uh, for example, I've just finished recording this talk before we started the live event. And if you want to keep track on what's going on in the future, please follow me on Eventbrite as well. I have two uh, social media channels, Instagram and Facebook. They show the same things. Basically, it's all about blogs um, and what to do in London, some virtual tours and some um, art and architecture blogs. So today is about London skyscrapers and most of you are from London, so I know you are aware, but there's more than a pretty face as we can see. <laughs> so London, the greater London is divided into areas called boroughs. And today I'm going to focus on the city. The city is the oldest part of London when Romans arrived 2000 years ago and uh, used to be the most important financial center of London and perhaps of Europe. Other skyscrapers area are Canary Wharf, here I put a dot rather than an area, Stratford, uh, where um, there were the Olympic Games in 2012, and then the newest area for skyscrapers is Nine Elms, a huge development around Battersea. Uh, London was quite late in having skyscrapers. If you think of Chicago, you think, you think of New York, they started to have skyscrapers from the uh, 1880s. And by 1893, uh, Chicago had 12 skyscrapers with more than 16 floors. Uh, but London had the first skyscraper in, uh, I think, the late 60s or early 70s. So why so, so much time? There is a rule in London called the right of sight, which was introduced, I believe, in 1938. It's a legal requirement for urban planning. Basically, in the city, there are two important monuments, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral and the Tower of London, which have a protected view. So from um, wherever you built a skyscraper, even in Barnet, even in Camden, you have to make sure you don't obstruct the site towards these two important uh, monuments. So this is the city, uh, the dark gray area, and you can see St. Paul's Cathedral here and the Tower of London. So Tower of London initially was built, uh, I think by the French and by Norman the Conqueror, <laughs> and St. Paul's Cathedral has a long history. The current building was designed by Christopher Wren and it was finalized in 1708. So from wherever you are, okay, you should be able to see these two buildings. Now I joined, I arrived in London. I'm originally from Milan, North Italy. And I joined, I relocated in London in 2007 to work in the city. And as a tourist, I went to see St. Paul's Cathedral and you, with your ticket, you can go to a rooftop that is a sort of balcony that runs around the dome of the church. St. Paul's Cathedral with its 111 meters has been for more than 300 years, the tallest building in London. But now looking east, this is a photo I took in 2008, I could see already some skyscrapers the Tower 42, built in 1980, and the Gherkin uh, 180, uh, built into, finalized in 2003. And something was built around here. So this is another photo. I did not take this one. It was something I found on the net. 
And this is a one new change, which is totally compliant with the rule of sight because it's quite smaller than the cathedral. A very beautiful mixed building with a panoramic rooftop open to the public. I hope to go back soon. But again, you see a new tower, Heron Tower built in 2011. The East is now fully covered by skyscrapers. This is a photo I found on the website on the website of this cityim.com in 2019. St. Paul's Cathedral, this is the balcony I was mentioning before, looking east. Again, Tower 42, but down where's the gherkin? Is hidden by the cheese grater. Uh, look at the names, that's part of the fun. <laughs> and by uh, the 22, the new skyscraper in London, this is the tallest after the shard. Definitely the tallest north side of the river. Something else uh, has been built, the Scalpel uh, 2018, and the Walkie Talkie with a fantastic sky garden panoramic rooftop. But where's the shard? Another photo that I found on the net. Um, this is a photo possibly by a drone or by an helicopter looking towards the west of London. So that's St. Paul's Cathedral. Look how small. Um, and this is the, um, the group of the new skyscrapers. I think this is fun. This is a round shape. Uh, this is again a financial company um, and it's called the Ham Can or the Ham Box because you can buy you know, ham covered by jelly in a box, so that's sort of shape. And here it is, the shard, finalized in 2012. At 310 meters, it's the tallest building in Europe, excluding Russia. Now, I used to have a tour going through this area, and this is possibly me <laughs> affected by the wind. So the bad side of those fantastic skyscrapers, they create intensify the wind speed to the point that it's quite dangerous if you ride a bicycle to go through this area. And so the, uh, the council of the city introduced the new guidelines three years ago for real estate developers uh, who have to provide in terms of planning also the proof that the new skyscrapers do not um, increase the wind speed above three, uh, sorry, eight meters per second. Today, it's more than double. And now I'm going to talk to you about my favorite skyscrapers. I hope you agree, but uh, I'm happy if you don't, because uh, at the end of the presentation, we can talk. So the shard is my favorite, absolutely, designed by Renzo Piano, one of the star architects in the world. He was made a senator for life uh, in Italy. And why I like the shard? First of all, I like its shape. The shard means a piece of broken glass. There's nothing broken. Of course, he refers to this final part, which is open. It's a panoramic rooftop that you can access. Uh, it's a ticketed area. And uh, the idea is to provide a dialogue with the past. So the, he made uh, Renzo Piano a lot of studies of the spires of the city back um, even before um, the Great Fire. This is London Bridge, which was uh, populated by buildings. Can you believe it? And uh, before tall buildings arrived, actually the tall buildings were made by uh, churches. So you can see the shard has a spire itself having a dialogue now with the spires of the, the city and the masts of the ships. Internally, um, you can access the restaurant and the, the uh, bars area, um, mid height, but you can also uh, go to the five star hotel or you can buy yourself a 10 million pounds apartment here <laughs> in the top area. Or uh, for about 15 pounds, you can access the panoramic rooftop. Innovation here is not just in the shape, it's in the structural elements. So uh, internally, uh, as in all the skyscrapers, it has an internal uh, structure of reinforced steel. But uh, what it matters here is something called post-tensioned concrete. So I found here the sort of tensions and stress 
concrete uh, has been uh, has gone through before being applied uh, in around the core here, the core of this reinforced steel. Now, after the Twin Towers attack in 2011, an organization in the US called the US National Institute of Standards and Tech provided indications on how to make tall buildings more strong. And the Shard is uh, one of the first buildings in Europe to adopt, to be compliant with these new standards. I also like this sort of facade, which is made of glass. It's a glass curtain. So the glass does not bear the, the weight of the building. And what I also like is a sort of reflection that the facade makes. So there's a lot of light in this area. Imagine uh, the, the, the water bounces off uh, the light and the light also natural light goes on the surface. And each time you walk past, you see different colors. You see yellow, you see different tones of grays, different tones of yellow, of blues, uh, fantastic. And the uh, building also triggered a major regeneration of the area, London Bridge, which was very rough, uh, including the train station, which is a, things, a thing of beauty itself. Something fun around the Shard, uh, it has been climbed several times illegally. <laughs> For example, Greenpeace sent six people um, and three of them with the ropes managed to arrive to the top. It took 15 hours, but the idea is to uh, uh, open their flag and protest against Arctic drilling uh, by oil corporations. But perhaps the nicest climbing, the most poetic, was done by this young uh, climber, George King Thompson in 2019, with no ropes, bare hands, 45 minutes. And his model, he said, was Philippe Petit, who in 1974 uh, walked on a rope between, set between the Twin Towers. So he did not climb the Twin Towers, but with friends, he organized the coup. And with this rope, he walked back and forth until he was arrested and then released. You can check out this fantastic experience on a documentary, film documentary called Men on Wire. The second building I really like is the Cheese Grater at 225 meters, built together with the Lloyds by Richard Rogers, another big star. This is a photo I took a few days ago. Uh, now, the Lloyds uh, was commissioned by the insurance brokerage Lloyd, Lloyds. Um, Lloyds is a very old company, 300 years old, which started in a coffee shop because at that time, financial institutions did not exist. And perhaps as a tribute to coffee shops, it looks like a coffee machine. And somebody else said it looks like a brewery. Um, so you can see all the infrastructure is put outside on the around the facade, pipes and lifts and anything. And this style is called inside out or bowelism. And this allows to have the internal space completely empty with a lot of light, a lot of air. And this is the vision of Richard Rogers to have places where people want to be, not just pass through comfortable places. Um, the cheese grater has this triangular shape to allow the site towards St. Paul's Cathedral, and we can see that. And again, all the infrastructure is shifted to the site. This yellow column is the lift area. And a few years ago, during an open day, which is a fantastic event that takes place in London every September, where you can see buildings usually closed to the public. Well, I went inside and I took the lift with the other visitors and look at the mechanical parts of the lifts uh, are made visible. So not only when you go up, you see outside, you see the entire London, but you can appreciate the details and the mechanical parts that bring you there. And once upstairs, there's this fantastic, really, um, area that the um, co main company that commissioned the cheese grater uses for clients, it's Aon, it's, it's an reinsurance company. And you can see to the east, the, sky, uh, the scalpel, but you can see um, this is tower, the Tower of London and the Victorian Tower Bridge. 
And then you can see um, the Sky Garden and Shard and to the west, the St. Paul's Cathedral. And this is bank, this is the Bank of England. And then uh, all London at your feet, fantastic experience. The final building I really like, the Gherkin, designed by Norman Foster. This amazing shape was uh, made uh, having in mind a cucumber. I know it's strange, but this reduces the pressure by the wind because the wind moves around. And what is also interesting is that um, by <coughs> building uh, in this way, um, Norman Foster also innovated in terms of energy efficiency. The method was to create some gaps in each floor to create uh, some areas called shafts. So, and these shafts ensure natural ventilation and ensure double glazing. So one glaze is the external glass and the other glazing is this air that moves in the shafts. Uh, the building was designed and built at the place of a previous institution called uh, the Baltic Exchange, which was destroyed by a bomb of the independent Irish movement in 1992. So why the council approved at the end of the 90s uh, such a weird uh, shape, it was to attract new business when companies were moving to the east to Canary Wharf and they were leaving the city. And, and this managed to attract the business back in some cases. I really like uh, this building because it provides major contrast to the historical architecture. For example, this church, which is in its foundations at least 1000 years old. Um, I think the contrast is brilliant. I want now to talk about uh, the first modern skyscraper, the one that was realized because of course, all those glassy buildings didn't come up um, from nothing. There's a history behind them in terms of history of architecture. Uh, skyscrapers were initially built in Chicago and New York, starting from the 1880s. Um, and we have examples from the 30s here, the Empire State Building and the Equitable Building, for example. They had an internal uh, rainforest steel structure and then they had this wall that was made by uh, bricks and concrete. It was a sort of curtain wall um, that did not bear the, the, the weight of the building, but still it was concrete. Nothing to do with the uh, examples we have just seen where the curtain wall is made by glass. So there's a sort of missing link that needs to be explained. Uh, back in the 30s, an architect called Ludwig Mies van der Rohe that was working in Germany and was also part of the teachers of the famous Bauhaus school uh, had the chance to leave Germany when the Bauhaus was closed by the Nazi party and become the sort of head of the architectural department at the Faculty of Architecture um, in Chicago. And he won the pitch, the, the competition to design something called the Seagram Building, uh, together with Philip Johnson, who was at the time an art historian, uh, director of the MoMA Museum of Modern Art. Um, the Seagram Building, uh, look at the facade, very different from the Equitable Building, the Empire State Building. So what you see here, the steel frame with this sort of vertical beams called eye beams, is not covered by concrete, but becomes part of the aesthetics. And glass is not just a window, but provides decoration itself. So you don't have useless decoration, as Mies was saying, but the useful parts uh, have intrinsic qualities that become decoration. So look at the facade from uh, bottom up. And look at the beams, look at the section of the beams, this sort of letter I defines the facade and its decoration. Now, Miss van der Rohe was a relatively young architect in the 20s. Think of Germany, think of post-World War I, when Berlin needed to be rebuilt. There was a competition at that time. Uh, Miss participated with this project with, and he made his uh, glass skyscraper in a photo montage showing 
uh, how it should have uh, nested in Berlin next to the old buildings. Look at the section, it looks like a diamond, a crystal. In fact, there was a huge debate in Germany on how to rebuild Germany after the First World War, not just in, as a matter of architecture, but as a matter of values, what sort of society should have prevailed, uh, should have overcome the bad values that took Germany into World War I. And the vision uh, was to create a new society that was the Bauhaus, as we know, but also a new society that had in nature its main example. And nature meant as a sort of mountain, as a sort of crystal mountain. So this skyscraper is uh, the empirical evidence of these theories of these utopias. Look, you can enter from three sides for the body to move freely. So people need to be free needed to uh, enjoy the space and not be constrained. Of course, he did not win the competition, but he went on at designing something else, the glass skyscraper. Here, the shapes are more rounded, but look at the photo montage that he created. It's quite shocking. These houses that in the UK, we would call the Victorian architecture next to something that you could see today here in the city or um, in Nine Elms or uh, in any parts of the world. And again, look at the plan. It's a biomorphic shape. It looks like a, a uh, sorry, a, like say a flower or a microorganism. Um, now with hindsight, uh, architects think this building could have never been realized because uh, the technology at the time could not allow this sort of architecture. But you, you, get, you get the message. Glass as a symbol of crystal should have reflected and allow, uh, reflected the outside and allowed the outside to see the inside. So the new humanity should have been open and work in a much more um, inclusive environment, allowing for brotherhood, allowing for full visibility and making sure everybody collaborated to the rest of the society. Now let's put everything in one sort of time machine and let's try to understand better where London comes here. Uh, so in blue, the modernism period, let's say post-industrial revolution with the key dates I would, uh, that are defined as World War I and World War II. And in the twenties, Mies and Bruno Taut, who was also an important architect in Germany. So London comes here with the right of sight. It comes here with a BT tower. It's not a skyscraper, of course, but it's the first building taller than St. Paul's Cathedral. So I put it here. And there's quite an agreement that from the 1970s, you have the post-modernism period, the post-digital revolution. So I start to think what could be uh, the events that are shaping this period or shaped this period so far. The first one is the so-called Big Bang, which is an, a set of rules, uh, uh, the regulation of the financial markets agreed between the, the Thatcher government and the London Stock Exchange to improve uh, the um, financial markets, to make them bigger, to expand them. And as a consequence of that, traders didn't have to physically go to the stock exchange floor. And uh, you remember those films of the past, you see buy, sell, buy, sell. They could trade online on a digital platform. And so financial companies needed to build bigger floors uh, for more people. And those bigger floors were ex expensive. So if you hire land in the city, it's very expensive. And that's why uh, financial companies commissioned new buildings in an era that was not as expensive as the city, which was Canary Wharf. Canary Wharf used to be a disused dockland in the east of London. And so one Canada Square, which is the first tall building in that area, was finalized in 1991, attracting new companies which were escaping the city. So that's why the Gherkin was introduced, was approved. And then you have a plethora of new architecture and uh, let's say Vauxhall, Nine Elms, Stratford are coming next. If you're interested in the future, I can dedicate a talk to this new area. 
postmodernism, this is the last slide, is said to have started with this book, this publication, Learning from Las Vegas, where the city is a strip and you can um, enjoy this city only by car. A group of architects went and studied Las Vegas and classified the buildings into two groups, the ducks and the sheds. The ducks are building like this one, uh, whose shape tells us about uh, its function. So we can understand that the duck is a restaurant or a cafe, definitely not a church. Or sheds are buildings whose shape, uh, it's very anonymous, we don't understand what they are. Uh, it's only what matters is the sign. So I challenged myself and I played ducks and sheds in London. I think the at Canary Wharf, the buildings are sheds. And I think that in the city, buildings are ducks. <laughs> what do you think? Um, yeah, yeah, that's. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I would like to ask you, what is your most loved or hated skyscrapers? We have nine minutes and we can talk. So I stop sharing.